Indeed, the little book of Ruth, the little four chapter book. And uh, we're going to, this, what's going to make this session kind of fun, we're not going to be in a hurry. Uh, this book lends itself to fairly limited time. If you have just a, an hour or two or three with a group, you can have a delightful time exploring this little book. Um, we're going to take our time and try to go through it, not exhaustively, but carefully. And uh, I think you'll see one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so in love with this little book, the book of Ruth. And we'll take it, uh, chapter one, of course, at this time. Now, why do we study this book? The first reason might surprise you. It's one of the most dramatic books of prophecy in the Bible. It's also the, uh, and it's interesting, that the ancient Jewish scriptures sometimes group this book, not with the book of Judges, which it fits historically, but with the book of the prophets. And uh, the basic theme that we have in our entire ministry is that these 66 books are a single message system, an integrated message system, in which in every book and every name, every detail is there by deliberate design. And one of the lessons you'll carry away from our exploration of the book of Ruth is the discovery that every subtlety in this book carries significance to uh, not just the theme of the book, but much, much broader than that. Every detail not only carries this romance you know, along, but uh, it, uh, the romance of redemption, but it also gives us hints about God's entire plan for the human race. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, in fact, I often call this book the romance of redemption. This book, by the way, is studied in colleges that have no interest in the Bible particularly. They study it as an elegant piece of literature. It's studied in literature courses because just simply by the elegance of the way this thing is crafted. And I think that's provocative. It carries along several key concepts to us. One of the key concepts that it exemplifies is the concept of a kinsman redeemer. We're going to understand what that really means. Uh, kinsman redeemer. Because that is one of the titles of Jesus Christ we need to understand. And I don't think you can understand Revelation chapter 5 until you've really understood the book of Ruth, interestingly enough. Something else about this book is I think it's going to teach us a great deal about one of the most muddled up con uh, uh, concepts in the church today. The distinction between Israel and the church. It's amazing how many concepts we encounter in today's society and in today's ecclesiology that are muddled up about the distinction between God's plan for Israel and God's plan for the church. And this little book in the Old Testament is just a gem in that regard. Now, it, we're, we're going to take an approach, and we're going to, I think this, our study is going to exemplify this approach that really fits any piece of Scripture. But this one's a, such a nice little contained package It'll be instructive to, to see that there are multiple levels of study. The primary application in any book, of course, is its historical reality. It records a history that really happened. It's not an allegory or just a nice tale. It really occurred. In this case, it occurred in a very unusual period of history called the Judges. Judges. This is after Moses and yet before they had a king. This very, very uh, strange time that we'll explore. Well, that's the first level, just the historical or actual practical level. The next one, I should say, is the practical level. Some people would call it the homiletic, and that's the application to our own lives. When we study a scripture, there's usually the, ex there's the exegesis, that's what does the text really say. Then there's the exposition, what did the text mean? And then there's the homiletic, how does it apply to us, our lives? Okay, it doesn't stop there. Then there's the prophetic revelations, the mystical or prophetic insights. What does this little book and that quaint little story back then tell us about the future? And it tells us a great deal, as we'll see. And then, of course, there's the, what the rabbis would call the remez, the hint of something even deeper. And uh, we'll, we'll discover some of that as we go. In the past, one of the ways I've taught this book would be to go through it and just read the history. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, understand the history. Then go back and see what it's really telling you 
under the current. And uh, you can, and you get a whole other perspective. Well, we're going to do all that together, I think, as we go forward here, because we, we're not rushed for time. And uh, something else the book is going to teach us a lot is about hermeneutics. That's your theory of inspiration. Every one of you has a hermeneutic. That is, you have an attitude or an approach or a belief about the text. And uh, some, some, many people have an attitude that's very broad, very casual, that, well, it's just a story, but it's useful. It's a soft, what we would call a soft hermeneutic. Others of us have a very strict hermeneutic. We think that it's designed by God in every word. And we, we have what, a very high view, a very tight view, a very rigorous view of hermeneutics. And that's every one of us will have something in between those two extremes probably. Now the Greek mind, most of us have a Gentile attitude, I'll call it the Greek model. We tend to think of prophecy as a prediction and it's a fulfillment. A passage that predicts something and then we see in history it happened. That to us is prophecy. Prediction and it's fulfillment. That's the Greek model. The Hebrew model is a little different. Their mindset's a little different. They see prophecy as pattern. They study the scriptures in terms of not just what it says, but the pattern it's laying out. And they note with great validity that the history of Israel is a history, is a, is a profile of the Messiah in many ways. So they're constantly studying patterns. We do too. We call them types or anticipatory models. And our basis for that is Hosea chapter 12 verse 10 where God expresses very directly. He says, God says, I have spoken by the prophets and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes. Similitudes, similes, allegories, and so forth in the, by the ministry of prophets. So we're going to be alert to that. Now we're going to discover as we go, this little book provides very key pieces of a chain of references. This book establishes the basis for Bethlehem being in the Messianic story. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Because of this little book. When the shepherds are in the flocks by night that we celebrate Christmas, they're in the fields of Ruth and Boaz. Why? What's going on? Why is the city of David Bethlehem? I thought he conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites. But Bethlehem is known as the city of David. Why? Because of this little book. Okay? And the cross. Everything goes to the cross. This is going to, to underscore what really, in effect, happened at the cross. And the fact that Jesus is destined for a crown, a crown of David. And he's going to sit on the throne of David. All these things are, uh, this book is right at the pivot of each of these issues. And there are a number of basic, the, uh, the concept of a kinsman redeemer is going to be dramatized in this story. And of course this distinction between the church and the nation Israel. These are all elements of things that we're going to be confronted with in very subtle and yet very clear terms. The book of Ruth. It occurs in the days the judges ruled. That's a key phrase. It's an opening phrase in the book. But we need to understand, what do you mean the days of the judges? And uh, we're going to talk about that. I'm also going to suggest to you the reason this book is so charming and so dear to me. It's the ultimate love story. It's the love story between Boaz, this wealthy landowner, and Ruth, who's a Gentile, uh, and we're going it, to, it's a charming, elegant little love story. At the literary level, it's studied in college for that, for just because of its structural components. At the prophetic and personal level, it'll impact every one of our lives. It's one of the most significant books of the church. If you take the, if you ask me what book in the Old Testament is the book about the church, you say, well, the church is not mentioned in the Old Testament. Not ex it's not revealed in the Old Testament. That's true. Paul tells you that in Ephesians 3. And yet, what we really understand the church from is the book of Ruth. And interestingly enough, to the Jewish uh, pattern, they always read this book at the time of the Shavuot. Feast of Weeks that we call Pentecost because that's the feast that predicts the church and it's linked in Jewish terms strangely to that very issue. The role of the kinsman redeemer, essential prerequisite to the book of Revelation, just to give you a perspective here. Now, it is in four chapters. The first chapter you could call Love's Resolve. 
we're going to see a resolution made, a commitment made, that is a model of this kind of a commitment. And that's in chapter 1, the main event of chapter 1, setting the stage and that resolve. That's when Ruth, this Gentile daughter-in-law, insists on cleaving to Naomi. We'll get into that. The next chapter is going to talk about love's response. And Ruth is going to provide the gleaning. That will explain how the welfare of a destitute widow dealt with, uh, how that was dealt with in ancient Israel. And that leads to chapter 3, a very unusual request that is given and granted in chapter 3. That's the, the big scene, the big plot twist that comes in chapter 3. And the big, that's the thrashing floor scene that we'll take on there. And then, of course, the fourth chapter is love's reward. So we have love's resolve, its response, its request, and reward. For those that like seminary models, that their alliteration always seems to underscore, it must be true if it's alliterative. And I'm being facetious, of course. But anyway, the redemption of both the land and the bride occurs. What does that really mean? We'll see that in chapter 4. But to, to our challenge to kick this whole thing off is simply chapter 1. As I say, the, the, the scroll of Ruth is read at Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, and that'll be profoundly significant as we go. And um, that's the only feast of Moses that uses leavened bread. And the significance of all that we'll review as we have the whole thing under our belt. Let's just jump right in. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. The, the, the text says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So that's the opening shot here. This first sentence tell, tells you what the incident is, where it took place, when it took place, and generally how it took place. Just like a good newspaper article, you got the first paragraph is the grabber, lays it all out for you. Now, the days when the judges ruled. What are we talking about there? The days when the judges ruled. That phrase opens our story. We need to understand the time of the judges. That was a period of time after Joshua had conquered the land. Moses and Joshua, we know the story, they conquered the land. That closes the book of Joshua. The book of Judges ends when Samuel, or you know, he's the last of the judges in effect, and he, uh, uh, the, the monarchy starts. In this period of time, it's a repeated time of failure. They fail to do what God says. They get into servitude under one of the other uh, uh, ruling uh, uh, pagan uh, forces there. They plead to God for a deliverer. God gives them a deliverer. They get delivered, and they fail again. And, one, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a half a dozen of these things, six servitudes, and uh, one after the other. It's a dark time in a sense, it's, a, it's a, re, a time of repeated failures. And one of the phrases that reoccurs all through the book is, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Now when you see that just a scattered sentence, it sounds pretty good. They did what they thought was right in their own eyes. You think that sounds pretty good. Not in context. They were doing what they thought they should do, not what God told them to do. That phrase is used in the Bible as a measure of darkness. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. It's a negative, if you will. So the period of the judges is a, a pattern of repeated failures, but there is one element in the scripture that's the gleaming light, and that's the book of Ruth, because it occurs during that time. That's why it usually find, find your Bible right after Judges, because it's at the time of the judges. And, uh, but the, if you study the book of Judges, it's one failure after another. So it's the era between Joshua and the monarchy, when the rulership was under the judges, not a king. It's also a time of scandals, by the way. There are scandals in the time of Gideon, and that's the time probably that this took place. Also Samson. We always celebrate the colorful pranks of Samson. But they, they didn't accomplish anything. They didn't accomplish much. Samson uh, was, a, you know, Samson's perhaps the best example of moral failure. Moral failure. So it's not a spiritually high time, and Ruth takes place in that period. It's a contrast, if you will, to that period. So it came to pass in the time of the judges when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. Famines occur at least 13 times in the Bible. 
And the reason why the family leaves where they live, which is Bethlehem, and they go to Moab is, is uh, 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 really a, uh, that's why they leave, is because of the famine. So that also, in a typological sense, indicates the famine was a judgment of God. And uh, it also may have been a response to the spiritual condition in the country. That's a speculation, but one that can be defended. Famines took place in the, lives, in the times of Abraham in Genesis 12, in David in 2 Samuel 2, in the days of Elijah, 1 Kings 17, in Gideon in the time of the Judges, chapter 6. And for a number of reasons, most scholars seem to uh, uh, come to the conclusion that this event occurs probably in or near and about the times of Gideon, if you will. And uh, so uh, the drought and famine were among the many judgments. God said he would uh, put on the land. It's a result of their failure to keep the law. That's Leviticus 26. says that four times. And Deuteronomy 28. The first half of Deuteronomy 28 are the blessings. The last half of Deuteronomy 28 are the curses. And uh, and one of these things, if they don't keep the law, they could expect famine. And that apparently what was going on in that region at the time this family decides to leave. And so uh, the, uh, and the book of Judges, of course, is just a repeated uh, sequence of their failure to keep the law and the judgments that came and then God delivers them and it's, it's, that, it's the pattern. Now the fact that the drought did not affect Moab, which is close to Israel, separ separated only by the Dead Sea. So it's a region they could get at, about 75 miles away, and uh, that uh, was not apparently experiencing this famine. You know, I read a lot of these commentaries, and a number of the commentators are really hard on this family. They shouldn't have really left. That part of their mistake was leaving and going to Moab. And, and people try to make it a moral case of that. I'm not here to disparage that. I think it's also a little unrealistic. There's famine. They're starving. There's another area where they, that isn't their land, they're, go, they're leaving, they're, they're, you, can, you can make a big moral case that they shouldn't have left, but it was a yeah, practical result to survive, it would seem, and yet they didn't survive, we'll get into that. So, it, it, this, it was a local family in Israel only, and that's why it seems to, most scholars, most commentators seem to see the famine in Judah as a judgment of some kind. It had to be a very serious one. Because, you know, it extended over that whole land. Otherwise, they could have simply sojourned another part of Israel rather than leaving Israel. You follow? That's one point of view. It also had lasted for several years. It's another, this wasn't, a, you know, just a bad season. Several years. That's caused them to leave the land. Ten years was, are going to go by before the way is clear for them to come back. And that, that's part of the story, of course, when they come back. And so... Uh, now, the Midianites had uh, oppressed Israel for seven years. The oppression included the destruction of the produce of the soil from this famine that would naturally follow, and that's one of the reasons we tie this to roughly Judges chapter 6 as a time frame. Okay. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah. That sounds like a strange way to call it. Bethlehem, Judah. See, there's another Bethlehem up in Zebulun. It's re you only see it mentioned once, I think, in Joshua chapter 19. So there's more than one Bethlehem. Uh, so, but the, the book of Ruth, this whole story is about the one that's in Bethlehem that you and I know. About six miles south of Jerusalem. And uh, Bethlehem Ephrata is another way you see it mentioned sometime. Ephrata was the ancient name for Bethlehem. And the name of the region, the, the area that Bethlehem, the town of Bethlehem, finds itself. And that's mentioned all through the scripture. And the, there shouldn't be any confusion about that. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn. Now that word we usually take quite casually. The word is ger, which means a resident alien. The root meaning means to live among people who are not blood relatives, be a foreigner. In other words, they left Judea to go to this place where, there was, where they could survive, knowing that they, would be a, they were foreigners there. They'd never be really accepted. Why? Because it's a different religion. They're still Jewish trying the best they can to be Jewish, but they're going to go into the region of Moab, which is a pagan environment. And many commentators are very, you know, uh, uh, judgmental on that. I don't have something to share that view, but, the, it, they, you know, it's a practical thing. He went to sojourn, realizing that that would be a hardship on them, but at least they'd survive. And it's, uh, uh, um, so we have uh, the, uh, the, purp the purpose of the trip was not permanent residency. 
They didn't have civil rights. They'd be dependent on the hospitality of the natives is the point. That's what the word sojourn uh, brings along. To the, to the, into the country of Moab. Now you need to understand Moab here a little bit. Moab, you may recall, was the son of Lot. And the, the, res, the result of an incestuous union with one of his daughters. Both, uh, you, you, you know, the, it, it, a grisly story there in Genesis 19. So, uh, uh, they, and also their history is pretty dismal. It's the Moabites that later on in Numbers 22 will hire Balaam to curse Israel during Israel's pilgrimage to Canaan. So they're adversaries. And uh, under normal circumstances, Moabites were barred from participation in the national or corporate life of Israel. Deuteronomy 23 expressly forbids marriage with Moabites. And yet this love story is going to be all about marrying a Moabite. It's going to be an exception to the general practice. And uh, there were nevertheless, in spite of all that, friendly relationships between some of the individual Israelites and the Moabites. An example of that is when uh, David was fleeing uh, from Saul. He found a friend in the king of Moab. So they're, even though they're still, they're, they're enemies in a sense, they're good, you know, they're, it was uh, salutary. Um, that same relationship, by the way, should be sensitive, is between Israel and the Persians. They have a history of, 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 of harmony in spite of the fact that they were at other times enemies. Now, the, okay, we get down to verse 2. The name of the man is Elimelech, and the name of his wife is Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Mahlon and Chilion, uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, uh, Bethlehem, Judah. Ephrathites is sort of the regional area that Bethlehem rides in. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. The name of the man, the name of his wife, the name of two sons. You get the impression, even way the text underscores this, names are significant. They're not incidental. They're going to be a very key part of this story. The name of the man. Okay. Name of the man was Elimelech. That turns out to mean, God is my king. And some, uh, some experts even say it means God is king. But the Maya is inferred. But it's an interesting name, though, because it's the name of Elimelech, God is my king, at a time when there was no king in Israel. That comes later. This is the time of the judges. Naomi means pleasant. Pleasant. And incidentally, as you just anticipate something here, Israel is sometimes referred to in the scripture as the pleasant land. So we can begin to suspect that Naomi somehow, idiomatically, is going to be an allusion to the nation Israel in some sense. Machlon comes from root kala, which means to be sick. His name means unhealthy or sickly. That's a tough handle to go through school on, right? Hey, sickly, you're on our team. Come on over here and be on our team. Doesn't work very well, does it? Huh? Hey, have I got a blind date for you? He's unhealthy and sickly, but trust me, it's going to be great. You know. It doesn't work too well. And Killian isn't much better. It means wasting or pining. He's the one that marries Ruth, it turns out. But anyway, all these names, by the way, appear in the Eucharistic text, which were discovered, that chosen to be typical names of, the, of that time. These are not unique names. They're apparently, uh, we, we encounter these names in some of the ancient archaeological discoveries. Not necessarily the same person, but those words were not unusual. Well, then the trouble starts. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, dies. And she was left with her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. That's quite a length of time. The women of Moab. Now again, Moab, you want to get the picture. Several times in the Psalms, God says, Moab is my wash pot. Or we might say, is my garbage can. Okay? And uh, so, Gentile marriage was forbidden in Deuteronomy 7. And uh, also in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. So we need to be sensitive to the fact that it was not considered kosher to marry a Moabitess. But grace is going to rule here. Because by grace... All things are possible. And we could divert into a whole study of grace there. But you can go to Romans 8 and John 6 and Ephesians 2 and 
capture it on your own. And again, I want to remind you, Israel is without a king here. The name of the one that, they, that marries is Orpah. And it means like a, uh, uh, it has to do with a neck, but it has to do, it, it suggests a, a, a fawn or a gazelle, something graceful, if you will, Orpa. And the other one is Ruth, which means friendship or desirable one, okay? And uh, those are the two gals. Mahlon married Ruth, and Kilian mentioned Orpa. It won't matter much because they're both going to die. I mean, both the guys, husbands are going to die. But anyway, Jews were forbidden to ma marry Gentile women especially those from Ammon or Moab, Deuteronomy 7, Nehemiah 13, Ezra 9. That's a, so we're here now we're suddenly confronting a very, very non-kosher practice here. And, uh, and to remind you what happened back in Numbers 25 in Moses' day back then, a couple of generations back here, it was the Moabite women that seduced the Jewish men into immorality and idolatry. And because of that, 24,000 died back in Numbers 25. So, you know, this, this, uh, this is, apparently these Moabite women were very attractive, and they were the mechanism by which uh, Israel was seduced into idolatry back then. Just a footnote here. Well, Machlon and Kilion died, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons, Naomi that is, was left of her two sons and her husband. So suddenly she has, Naomi is really clobbered here. She's lost her own husband and also her two daughters' husbands, her two sons-in-law, also died. So she's really stranded here in a foreign land in trouble here. Now you understand when Elimelech left Bethlehem ten years ago, he lost his property. He either sold it or he lost it through indebtedness. He somehow got disenfranchised, which is another contributing factor to their leaving town. That's a factor that's going to be very, very significant when we get to chapter 3 and 4. So, so the context here is the land was lost, and, and part of this story we're going to deal with is redeeming the land, whatever that means. How does that work? Okay. Then she arose, Naomi that is, with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard that the, in, in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. In other words, they're living in Moab, been there ten years. The, the three men have died. She's got these two daughters-in-law. She gets word that back home in Bethlehem, things are better. The famine's over. There's a seven-year famine, and they've been there ten years. That all kind of fits, by the way, what we think we know about the history. But now that things are better back home, She's going to go back home. When she goes back home, she's destitute. She's, she's a widow. And her daughters-in-law are widows. So she's dependent on a peculiar technique they had in that culture that we'll get to next time. How they, but she point she's destitute. But nevertheless, she realizes that at least the, God is blessing Israel. She wants to go back to her homeland. Okay. Giving, visit his people, giving them bread. Key word. What is the word for bread? Lechem. What's the name of the town? Beth Lechem. House of bread. Not accidental. Not accidental. It's part of the tapestry we're watching here. Beth Lechem. House of bread. Wherefore, she sent forth out of the place where she was and sent her two, da and, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return unto the land of Judah. So they apparently are starting to leave they, they've picked the on-ramp of the freeway heading back to Bethlehem, being facetious, of course. Okay. And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as ye have dealt with the dead, that, are, that is their husbands, and with me. So she's on her way. They're with her. She's sending them, come on, you stay home. You, you, you don't want to go to our strange place. We're Jewish, and it's all Jewish there. You, you go home to your own mother's house and, and, and marry again, is, is the concept. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And she kissed him, and they lifted up their voice and wept. To the young girls of that day, having rest meant having a husband to provide for them. Their husbands have died. 
but they're still young enough to stay in their culture and find a husband and have a life. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of your, her husband, that is, your husband to come. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said to her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They both indicate that they're going to stick with their mother-in-law. This is not a place for mother-in-law jokes. Naomi's quite an exception here. These two girls are willing to leave what they know and stay with Naomi to go to this land where they're so Jewish. Which has, you know, that's not just a, a cultural thing. That's a deeply rooted thing they would be buying into here. Naomi now, and I wish I had the gift of uh, dialects. Some of my friends are so good at this, I'm not. But this coming passage, you really need to have a good New York dialect. Because Naomi is going to argue like a Jewish mother, okay? Naomi says, turn again, my daughters. Will ye go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Okay. Turn again, my daughters. Go your way. For I'm too old to have a husband. And if I should say I have hope, and if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay? <laughs> this is so, you know, so contrary to fact reasoning here. Would ye tarry for them till they were grown? Would ye stay for them from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. Ooh, that's an interesting phrase. That's not just a complaint. That's an ascription. Naomi realizes that the judgment of God has been against her. Her husband's gone. Her two she sees in all this God's provision or lack thereof, however you want to put that, you know. But it's interesting how she's arguing with them that how stupid are you? You can't stick with me because if I, had a, if I should find a husband and we should have more sons and by the time they're grown, you're going to hang around till they're of marriage age? You know, you're, you're, you're going to be 20 years too old. Yeah, 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 see, the whole thing is... But notice that Naomi recognized that all that had happened to her was not pure chance but the hand of the Lord. And the hand of the Lord is indeed upon her in ways she has no ability to, for, to, to uh, anticipate. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth clave unto her. See, Orpah was going to stay, but Naomi talked her out of it. So Orpah is going to disappear from the pages of history. Okay? We don't know what happened to her. I assume she got back to Moab and found a neat young man and they had a wonderful life and who knows. But she's in oblivion as far as the text is concerned. They lifted up their voice and wept again, both of them. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. So Orpah goes back off the pages of history. But Ruth clave, that's an interesting word, tabak, which means to stick like glue. That's what the lexicon actually calls it. That's Ruth. You know, that's an interesting thing. She's a Gentile. She's a Gentile. She's a Moabitess. And she chooses to cling to Ruth. And uh, see, it's the same, the same thing that induced Orpah to return home as would cause Ruth to stay. The fact that Naomi will no longer have a husband or sons meant that she needed someone to take care of her. Ruth understands that when Naomi goes back home, she's destitute. She has no property. She has no, she has no husband. She's going to need someone to take care of her. She's getting older. Ruth is stepping into that role of serving her mother-in-law. She understands that she's going to need help. And Ruth isn't going to be equipped to do much else but beg or whatever they do. And we'll come to that next, in the next chapter. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Naomi's saying, you know, Orpah's got sense in her head. She's going back. You should go too, Ruth. That's what she's saying in effect. Okay? Notice this. Thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people and unto her gods. This isn't just a geography thing. This is a religious thing. Your gods. What were her gods? Their national god was called Chemosh. Numbers 21, 1 Kings 11. 
And among other things, to give you a quick snapshot here, they accepted human sacrifices. We are talking a pagan culture here. Okay, that's what they were brought up in, that's what they understood, and that's what Orpah returned to, okay? Now, by the way, this stuff is re found in the Moabite stone. I'll come to that. King Mesha wrote a Moabite stone. The Moabite stone is a black basalt memorial stone that was discovered in Moab by a German missionary back in 1868, okay? That's roughly what it looks like. It's about four feet high. It contains about 35 lines in an alphabet that is very close to Hebrew. A little different, but discernible. It was probably erected about 850 B.C., called it almost 3,000 years ago, by a Moabite king, Mesha. It's interesting. His story is written in the stone, it celebrated his overthrow of the nation Israel. That's his version. The account in 2 Kings 3 makes it clear that Israel was victorious in that battle. But Mesha has his view of it. I'm reminded when I was in Cairo, I was stunned to see all these incredible monuments celebrating their victory in the Yom Kippur War, Kippur War of 19, what was it, 73? Uh, and, uh, you know, they got wiped out. Eric Sharon had the third uh, Egyptian army surrounded. They were totally at the mercy of Israel until Kip, you know, uh, um, Kiplinger, uh, that's not right. What's it? Huh? Kippinger, yeah. Anyway, he's dispatched there to unwind that because we wanted to give them something to hang on some... So it was diplomatically snatched out from Israel's... You know, they snatched the defeat from the jaws of victory, if you will. Uh, but from the Egyptian point of view, they celebrate it like it's a victory. It's a, so ironic, uh, so, it's such a, so contradictory to the actual history. A well, similar kind of thing apparently going on here. But the passage shows that Mesha honors his god, Chemosh, in terms similar to the Old Testament reverence for the Lord. There's a parallel commitment, if you will. And the inhabitants of entire cities were apparently slaughtered to appease Chemosh. And uh, so, uh, anyway, very, par very par parallel thing. Now, the Moabite stone has profound biblical relevance. The reason I bring it into our study here. It confirms the Old Testament accounts, that is, the existence of these things. It's valuable geographically because it mentions no less than 15 sites that are in the Old Testament. That, you know, they're alluded in the Old Testament, and the Moabite stone makes reference to these. It also resembles Hebrew, the language in which most of the Old Testament was originally, that's Paleo-Hebrew, uh, the, the ancient Hebrew, uh, that it was originally uh, uh, written in. Now, some pieces of that stone are still in, on display in the Louvre, in Paris, by the way. If you're there, maybe it's something you want to look up. Anyway, let's get back to verse 16. Naomi's trying to talk Ruth into joining Morpa and, and going home. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or return from following after thee. And she now is going to express a commitment that echoes throughout history as one of the most eloquent expressions you've, you'll, ever, you'll find anywhere. So we're going to take a look at this very carefully. Here's what Ruth says to her. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. And thy God, my God. Wow, that's not a casual little Sunday school commitment kind of thing. This is serious stuff we're dealing with here. She was raised in Moab, an idol-worshipping Gentile country. She was abandoning everything, okay? And not because she was married to a husband, he's dead, but to follow her mother-in-law, including adopting a totally strange way of life from her point of view. She continues, where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried, and the Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. She's taking a death oath here, a commitment that goes to death. Wow, 
She also uses a very unusual word here. The Lord do so to me. Yehovah. Yodhe in the rabbinical terms. She invoked the name of God in her oath and not the name of Chemosh. You get the impression that she's learned a lot in the brief time she's been with Naomi and apparently her husband and so on. Sevenfold decision. For whither thou goest, I will go. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people. Thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die. And there will I be buried. Two different things. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. Whew. Quite a statement. A similar formula you'll find seven times in the books of Samuel and the Kings. Eli concerning Samuel, Saul of, uh, of Jonathan's execution. These are all uh, Jonathan's friendship with David, David's concerning Nabal, David concerning Amasa, Ben Hadad concerning Samaria, and the king of Israel regarding Elijah, the, the, the death oath kind of thing. Anyway. But let's keep in mind now, there's an overlay on all this. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 3, an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. They're not allowed to be part of that society. Even to their tenth generation. Remember that tenth generation thing. That's going to come up later. Shall they not enter into the congregation of the Lord forever? And how can Ruth enter into the congregation of the Lord? How can she do that? Well, same way you and I can. By trusting in God's grace and throwing herself entirely on God's mercy. Which is what she's actually doing. The law excludes us from God's family. But grace includes us if we put our faith on our kinsman redeemer. But that's coming later. It's interesting too, another comment I'll make, the genealogy of Jesus Christ that we find detailed for you in Matthew 4 includes the names of five women, four of whom have questionable credentials. Tamar committed incest with her father-in-law, Genesis 38. Rahab was a Gentile harlot. She ran a house of ill repute. Ruth was an outcast Gentile Moabitess. She's in that list, if you will. And of course Bathsheba is mentioned by name, but the wife of Uriah is, and she of course was an adulteress. Four questionable credentials. Who's the fifth woman? Mary. But we'll go on. How did they ever become part of the family of the Messiah? Through the sovereign grace and mercy of God. God is, as Peter reminds us, long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Praise God. Let's go on here. When she saw that she was steadfast, when, when Naomi saw that Ruth was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left speaking unto her. Now I assume that means they just didn't discuss it anymore. I don't think she went in a pout and stopped speaking to her altogether, but then again, you can draw your own conclusions. So they went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them and they said, Is this Naomi? That's a journey of about 75 miles. That's not a casual stroll, gang. You want to go on foot for 75 miles? And not straight or level, by the way. They would have to descend from the Moabite highlands to the Jordan Valley. That's a descent of about 4,500 feet, almost a mile in altitude. Followed by then an ascent to Bethlehem of about 3,750 feet, walking through desert territory through the wilderness of Judah. So a uh, non-trivial thing. But what interests me too, when they came, it came past when they were come to Bethlehem that all the city was moved about them. Now admittedly, Bethlehem was not probably a big burg. Estimates typically are in the neighborhood of seven, eight thousand. You know, trivial by our standards, and at the same time in terms of a, a rustic town, non-trivial. And yet, their arrival stirs up a lot of discussion from the residents. That's interesting. All the city was moved about them. Is this Naomi? They haven't seen her for 10 years. She's back. Really? What's going on here? What Naomi says, that Naomi said to them, Call me not Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. 
So Naomi's got a pretty low morale here. Naomi means pleasant. That's what it means. So she says, don't call me Naomi. I'm not pleasant. Call me Mara. That means bitter. That means bitter. You know, Exodus 15 gives you an example of that. But she uses also an interesting word for the Lord. She says, for the Almighty, Shaddai, which actually it refers to a breast. It means the provider, but it also it thus becomes the label meaning the Almighty. Whenever you see it translated in your English, it'll be the Almighty. That's used 48 times in the Old Testament, 31 times in the book of Job alone. El Shaddai, El God Almighty, Shaddai. God's Almighty, but he's de dealt very bitterly with me. I've lost my two sons. I've lost my husband. I've lost my two sons. She quickly will start counting her blessings. Ruth was with her. But at the moment, she's really dragging here. She says, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why call ye me Naomi, seeing that the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? Heavy stuff. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. In the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, Naomi returned, Ruth the Moabitess, we guess we've, we've got that clearly, out of the country of Moab, so they come from this hostile land. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now, one of the things the rabbis will teach you in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the text, when you see an unnecessary detail, that's a signpost that says, dig here. There's a treasure tucked away. You're going to discover there are all kinds of little Jewish indicators throughout the story that you'll miss as you just read it through. But I want you to notice, this is the beginning of the barley harvest. When we get to chapter 3, we're going to be dealing with the wheat harvest. And it's going to be useful for us to get a feeling for the calendar, the barley harvest. Barley ripened before, uh, ripened before wheat, began to reap roughly early March, but sometimes. But generally it's April or Abib in the, on the Jewish calendar. The barley harvest is the first hint of this story, this, this mournful tale, taking a twist. Let's understand the agricultural calendar of, 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 of Israel. It's amazing how many of our conceptions are uh, marginal at best if we don't really understand that calendar. We're on a Gregorian calendar. In our calendar, there's a region that we would call March or April. On the Jewish calendar, it's the first month of the year after Exodus 12, the, the month of Nisan. An earlier label for that same month was Abib. But that's the first of the religious calendar. God ordains that as such in Exodus 12. The farming calendar, this is the time of the later rains. That may confuse you because it's early in our administrative year, but it's the later years, uh, later rains on the farming calendar. And this is where the barley harvest starts and the flax harvest starts. The special days of Nisan are, of course, Passover. The 14th is Passover. On the 10th, they inspect the lambs, and 14th is Passover. And that's ordained in Exodus 12, but it, the details or celebration are in Leviticus 23. And then that also kicks off a period uh, of un, uh, that we call the, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's Leviticus 23, from six to, verses 6 to 8. And then there is, in many, count, many of your references will speak of uh, the first fruits. That's not really the way it's actually described. Uh, the way it's often described in your helps is incorrect. In Leviticus 23, 9 through 14, it makes it quite clear that it's the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. That's a Jewish way of saying it's the Sunday following Passover. That was the Feast of Firstfruits. 
It's always on a Sunday. Why? It's the morning after Shabbat, after Passover. Passover can be any day of the week, depending on the year. You know, the weekly cycle. It can be on a Monday or Wednesday or whatever. But whatever it is, the following Shabbat, then the next morning, is the Feast of First Fruits. And that's the biblical way of pointing to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so, for what it's worth. Now, if you were in the early church, the first few centuries of the church, and you attempted to honor Passover as a believer in Christ by using the biblical calendar, you would be excommunicated from the church. You were called a quarter decimans, which is the Latin for 14, because the church was trying very hard to separate itself from Jewishness. Now, if you, if you tried to be biblical then, you were considered a heretic. Strange days. Strange days. Well, let's go to the next month on the calendar. April, May on our calendar would be the second month of the Jewish calendar, Iyar. Also early and early re renderings uh, re uh, rendered as Ziv. And uh, on the farming calendar, it's the dry season begins. The next month, May, June period, on the Jewish calendar, it's the third month of the year, it's Savan. Now, on the farming calendar, that's when the fi early figs begin to ripen and vines are tendered, uh, uh, tended and so forth. And it, and it has a special day. It's 50 days after first fruits. Nominally on the calendar, it's the 6th of Savan, but that it really depends. The main point is it's 50 days after first fruits, which depends on where first fruits is, okay? And this is what we would, uh, uh, this Shavuot is what we would call, what's also called the Feast of Weeks. It's what we would call the Feast of Pentecost. It's the Feast of Moses that predicts the church. It's the only feast in the, in the celebration of Moses that uses leavened bread, interestingly enough. It's interesting that the Jewish liturgy, the scroll of Ruth is always read at Shavuot, which is the Mosaic feast that we now know is anticipatory of the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. How interesting that the little book of Ruth is somehow linked to the, to the Feast of Pentecost. I think that's fascinating. Okay, the fourth month, we would have call it June or July, but in the Jewish calendar is Tammuz, fourth month. On the farming calendar, that's the wheat harvest, and we're going to encounter that when we get to chapter 3. That's where you also get the first ripe grapes. Note that. Your grapes start earliest is maybe in what we would call July. Then that brings you to the fifth month of their calendar, July-August, the month of Ab. And uh, that, uh, now that's when they harvested the grapes. Now what I find fascinating about this, I have read more papers trying to justify grape juice at Passover, for at the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a time of Passover, which is the spring. They couldn't have grape juice in the spring. They had no refrigeration. Let's get serious. The grape harvest is in the fall. If you want grape juice, great. You better get it in the month of August or it's going to spoil because grapes naturally preserve themselves through fermentation. It's called wine. It's interesting, by the way, there are special days in the month of Ab. The 9th of Ab is the date that is a day of mourning for Israel because that's the date that the temple fell. That's the date of the Kristallnacht. You can go through Israel, the Jewish history, and every time they are really oppressed by the Babylonians or the Romans or the Nazis, what have you, it's always on the 9th of Ab. So, it gets, so they get very, I'll use the term superstitious, about that month. Because that's always the month that seems to be picked for their being crushed. But anyway, uh, you might just remember the grape harvest is in the fall. Because I think that is an important thing to understand. And that brings you to August, September, which is the sixth month of their calendar. And that's when the dates are harvested. And that's where the summer figs uh, are, are still being harvested. And then you get to September, October. That's the month of Tishri. An early label for that month was Athanim. But it's the seventh month of their calendar, if you're taking Nasan as the first month. Tishri was the first month of the Genesis calendar, but that gets all revised by God in the book of Exodus chapter 12. So this, uh, that's the month of Tishri. 
This is when they get the early rains. The month, in the month, but the early rains are in the fall on, 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 on their reckoning. And they're early because that was the beginning of their original civil calendar. Special days, of course, the first of Tishri is the, fe is the Feast of Trumpets. The first of Tishri is also a civil celebration called Rosh Hashanah. Their civil New Year starts on the first of Tishri. But distinguish between the Rosh Hashanah, which is a civil celebration, and the Feast of Trumpets, which is the religious uh, uh, celebration. Ten days later, on the 10th of Tishri, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And then five days later begins a week-long feast called Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And so that's the, the fall feasts. You have three feasts in the spring in the month of Nisan. You've got Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, and Feast of First Fruits. You have three feasts at the end of the cycle. Tishri, Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Between those two groups, you got this weird one. Fifty days after Feast of First Fruits, not after Passover, after Feast of First Fruits, you have the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. At which time the church is born, and also at which time the Book of Ruth is on the Jewish uh, reading list. How interesting. Book of Ruth, it's, it's going to be full of these little in interesting. So, just as a quick summary of what we've seen, in the days the judges ruled, very, not, there isn't a king yet. Famine drives the family to Moab. And then we have all these names. Elimelech, God is my king. Naomi, pleasant land. Mahlon, unhealthy, to blot out. Kilian, puny, those two guys die as well as in Elimelech. Naomi deters her daughters from following her. Orpah yields and doesn't follow. Ruth sticks, cleaves like glue <laughs> to Naomi. So for your next session, I want you to read very carefully chapter 2. Because it's a very colorful, direct little story, and yet it is littered with little surprises hidden underneath the sentences. And I also want you to study, one of the reasons the book of Ruth is so rich in, in, in illuminating us, it depends on understanding the ancient laws of Israel. Israel had some practices that are very strange. The law of gleaning, the law of the Leverite marriage, and the law of redemption. And this is the, the book of the Bible. It is legislated in the Torah, but it is exemplified in the story of Ruth. So I want you to study the law of gleaning. It's in Leviticus 19.9 and 10, and Deuteronomy 24, 19 and 20. What, how does the law of gleaning work? That was their provision for the destitute. If you owned an a, a area of land, you were allowed to bring, let your reapers go through it once and only once. Whatever they missed, you had to leave there for the destitute, the widows and orphans and people in need. Because they were allowed to follow your reapers and take what, glean what was missed. That was their form of a welfare state, gleaning. So obviously Naomi and Ruth, and Ruth because she's younger would do it for Naomi, she would follow the, the, the gleaners, and that was legal, and you were, you, you, it was against the law to go back a second time. What you couldn't get on your first pass was the property then of those that were in need. And that's operative there to understand the peculiar dynamics of going on chapter 2, except pay attention because chapter 2 has some very subtle surprises in it that set you up for the rest of the story. So that's your time for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer.